our speaker is Harold, Harold Dillinger on uh, mysteries of the Grinter Farm flight. Larry, you want to take a minute? Sure. All right, I'll give you the, the brief rundown. I'll give you the brief version of Harold's bio, all right? But basically, he's an author of books. He's a local historian. Um, his favorite things are the war between the states, Jesse James, and, uh, and just Missouri, you know, Confederate and war between the state history. That's, that's his area's specialty. Uh, he's the president of the Quantrill Society. Woo! Partisans. Um, you know, uh, there's a couple of his books that you may recall that I believe he did at least the editing on. Uh, Jesse James, The Best Writings About the Notorious Outlaw and His Gang. That's one of his books. And the other one was Quantrill, Quantrill and Other Curiosities. Um, anyway, Harold was raised, uh, you know, grew up a lot in northeast Missouri, and that's where his Missouri Confederate ancestors are from. Probably rode up there with Porter's Gang and stuff like that. So he's kind of up around a little north of Kirksville area. He's of course, he lives here in Independence nowadays. Um, with that, are you ready, Harold? Yeah. All right. He is ready. So with that, we give you Harold Dellinger. All right? Thanks for being here, Harold. You haven't heard it yet, so... Well, we'll save our, reserve our thanks for later. Okay. <laughs> Well, just a few additions to the biography. Uh, yeah, I did have a bunch of relatives with the uh, Porter's Guerrilla Army in Northeast Missouri. At Fourteen that I know of the Battle of Kirksville, the Brosters. Mm -hmm. The surnames are right anyway. I don't know who all of them were, but uh, there were several. And uh, also grew up, my dad was a Missouri Highway Patrolman, and so we lived several places around Missouri, and I actually went to high school in Carrollton, Missouri, which is not, nothing to brag about, I assure you, <laughs> but I uh, hope nobody's here from Carrollton. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> all I know is they surrendered to Clifton Hill School anyway, the town of Carrollton did. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just over the Grand River. Okay. Uh, and president of the Quantrell Society for some six years now. I was just trying to figure out how many years it's been. I believe it's six and a half now, uh, which is uh, quite a little while, I assure you. Seems like can't get anybody else to take over, can well, you? Well, can't get anybody to do it the way I want them to. <laughs> Go do it right. You got to do it yourself. <laughs> But I notice a uh, number of members here tonight, actually. Uh, David Goodman's in back, Terry Elliott, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, and probably I'm missing somebody, Tim. I don't always even see the membership list, so I, I don't always know who's paid up and who isn't. But, uh, uh, oh, there's Bob Caps. You're next president. Well, might be. Hey, I'm, I'm taking the picture. Website, so watch right. there you go. <laughs> and I do have uh, newsletters that were out just a month or so ago. Somebody interesting on the front. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Well, am I on it or? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I see somebody's backside here. It kind of looks like you. But if anybody uh, would like a newsletter, uh, by all means, Thank you. have it. Uh, Give you an application too. No, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob Cap said it said it was you, so it's you. All right, I'm famous. <laughs> Sir, application. Sir, you want me to pass them around for you? Yeah. Uh, How many newsletters do you have? I don't know, but there's <laughs> several people who already got one. So take as far as it'll go, right? So do you have to be a cousin of Quantrill to join the Quantrill Society, Harold? No, mm -hmm. you don't. Okay. It's open to all, all of us. You can be a party member. Oh, you can't say you're a member. You're a member. 
Like so many of these uh, events, Civil War events, there, there's as much not known as, as is known. Uh, it gets a little murky sometimes about what really happened. And I'm not, not sure we'll get a complete truth tonight either, but uh, we're going to beat, beat it around a little bit. The Greater Farm Fight uh, happened July 6th. 1864, almost 150 years ago, you'll notice. And uh, what was happening in uh, Jackson County and, and, in fact, all of western Missouri is uh, there were no regular Confederate forces to speak of in, in western Missouri. Uh, there may have been a few recruiters, may have been a few spies, and that, that sort of situation. But what they did have was a lot of Confederate guerrillas. Uh, <coughs> it's it's uh, almost a year after Order Number 11, rural Jackson County, Bates County, Vernon County, Cass County were uh, almost depopulated. This was by design. Order number 11 ordered the de depopulation of the rural areas of the county because of their alleged support for the guerrillas, uh, which was, was probably true. But anyway, many houses were burned. Uh, few crops still standing in Jackson County and other areas, and so the uh, federal authorities were, were having a hard time uh, finding any, any other way of uh, trying to control the guerrillas. One thing they did try was to bring in the second Colorado out of uh, Colorado. And uh, these were uh, experienced Indian fighters, real tough guys, mountain men, miners, uh, somewhat older than the average gorilla who was probably 17, 18, 19, or 20, something like that. Fuzzy cheeked Missouri farm boys, and, and so they sick these. Uh, tough guys from Colorado on to the uh, uh, guerrillas to try to control them. Most, most of the second Colorado was stationed in Independence and uh, tried to control the whole county from there. <coughs> <coughs> what was happening actually in the guerrilla ranks was uh, there was a real crisis of leadership going on uh, Quantrell had become disillusioned uh, and also in love. I don't know if these things were uh, related or not, but uh, at any rate he lost enthusiasm for, for dealing with uh, some of the problem personalities in the guerrilla ranks, such as Bloody Bill Anderson and George Todd. So by the first of uh, July, Quantrell has uh, left the scene, apparently went to North, uh, Howard County, hit out with uh, Kate King and, and some other partisans. And George Todd had taken over uh, as the, the leader of at least a, a large portion of uh, the 
Confederate guerrillas in Jackson County. On uh, so through through the summer, early summer of uh, 1864, Second Colorado uh, really gave the uh, guerrilla forces uh, a lot of trouble. Uh, following them, uh, intelligence, uh, and, and they were having a hard time uh, fighting off the second Colorado. I often think of the, the scene in uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and the Pinkertons, you know, are uh, following them just right, right along, and uh, <laughs> Paul Newman says, who are these guys, you know? And, uh, uh, but anyway, it was effective, and that's kind of what Second Colorado was doing. So we come up to my notes. Uh, so we come up to July sixth, eighteen sixty-four, and uh, the Grinter Farm was on what is now present-day uh, Lee Summit Road, just north of uh, Truman Medical Center East. There's a four-way stop there, uh, and the Grinter Farm was just a little bit north of there. The Grinters were uh, northern sympathizers, as a matter of fact, but friends of the Youngers. The Youngers that owned the site where Truman Medical Center East is now, and the Grinters were the next farm over, and they were friends. The Grinter house had not been burned <coughs> because they were friends with the Youngers. Uh, and it's even, even said that uh, one of the Grinters was the, the only one to cast a vote for Abraham Lincoln in 1864 Ooh. in the county. But uh, at any rate, they were friends of the Youngers, and they were not burned down. Uh, but anyway, that was uh, what is now Lee Summit Road was called the Independence to uh, Pleasant Hill Road, Major Road South. Uh, so on on the morning of uh, July six, Todd and and the other guerrillas are camped nearby at what was called the Moore Farm. The, the Moore Farm log cabin was still standing as recently as 25, 30 years ago, but I believe it must be gone now. Uh, I can't find it anyway. And, uh, and anyway, they first thing they did that morning was cut the telegraph wires. And this, of course, brought immediate response from in independence, they send out uh, troops to hook the telegraph back up again. It's it's thought that the guerrillas thought uh, that General Brigadier General James Totten was going to Pleasant Hill down that road with the Second Colorado es escort that that morning. James Totten was a was the Inspector General of Union Forces in, in Missouri, and, and they really wanted him, uh, as well as not liking the <coughs> Second Colorado. So, uh, sure enough, by and by, the. Uh, Second Colorado comes up the road, about 24 of them by some accounts, 60 by some other accounts, which I'll read, read to you briefly. And uh, four, four guerrillas stopped in the road till they saw the Second Colorado saw, turned around, headed, headed south, Second Colorado charged after them. Uh, the guerrillas under uh, Dick Yeager came in from the brush and got him on the side. And a classic guerrilla ambush, which they did 
just hundreds of times. <laughs> so, uh, heavy losses, a real Donnybrook actually, all in a big open field there, less than an acre. Uh, guerrilla forces, second Colorado forces, guerrillas had two, three, four uh, Colt revolvers apiece. The second Colorado had carbines of some sort and a pistol of some sort, Starlight or something, I don't know what it was. And not, none too effective. Uh, so, this is where some of the uh, mysteries start coming in. Uh, A Union account is, on assuming command, Colonel Ford proceeded to distribute his forces throughout the sub-district in such a manner as would be best calculated to conduct the campaign against the squads of bushwhackers. During the campaign, a portion of the troops had been stationed at Camp Smith, some three miles southwest of Independence. This is probably the old... Uh, Independence Fairgrounds near Rock Creek School, if anybody knows where that is. And on the 6th of July, Captain Seymour Wagner of C Company and 25 of these men left camp and proceeded until they arrived at the Pleasant Hill and Independence Road, about eight, eight miles distant. There they saw four men who immediately took to flight, and while pursuing them, our party was charged by a party of nearly 100 bushwhackers who were lying in ambush awaiting their approach. <clears throat> they rushed forth from the dense thicket with savage yells, maybe a rebel yell, and poured a deadly volley into the midst of the scouts. Firmly stood their ground. The foe came rushing on until the com combatants were mingled together fighting a hand-to-hand -hand encounter amidst the fallen dead and dying until gallant Wagner fell, mortally wounded, and dragging himself to one side, he gave a farewell shot that sent an enemy reeling to the ground. He shouted, give him death, boys, and breathe these last. Uh, the loss of the enemy was nine killed, in other words, nine guerrillas killed according to this account, and 15 wounded, and some nine of the 2nd Colorado, and brought them to, brought the 2nd uh, Colorado back to Independence where they were buried. A more interesting account, perhaps, is one from uh, one of the old Jackson County histories. Which I've lost. Look for my bookmark, maybe. Not unnamed Confederate or Bush, Confederate bushwhacker uh, is talking to Hickman, who wrote this history, and he asked him where the men from the Wagner fight were killed, buried. I told him he could. Said, that was the hardest man I ever saw to, to kill. How do you know about him? I asked. He replied, "I sent three dragoon balls through that man's body before I knocked him out of the saddle." You're talking Wagner, right? Mm -hmm. So they killed Wagner? Yeah. We had gotten word, orders from George, George Todd, who was then in Jackson County. When the men had gotten there, we counted off, and there were 63 of us, not 100, as the previous account said. We threw out our pickets and away to develop. One of the pickets concealed himself and counted 62 on the federal side. Uh, 
As soon as our commander saw that they were in the open field, he ordered the charge. At it we went, whooping like wild Indians. As soon as the Federal commander heard us, he stopped in the pursuit and turned these men to meet. There we were, 62 men on one side, 63 on the other. In less than a minute, the whole 20, 125 of us were fighting on one acre of land. None of our men had less than two, and some of them three and four Colt six shooters, while the Federals only had one with carbine and saber. We soon discovered their pistols were empty, and then we got just as close to them as possible and used our own pistols to the best advantage. There was not a command given after the first one, or if given, was not heard or heeded. This accounted for, uh, it was a pattern called, let's see, I fought men of many different commands while in the war, but I never fought a braver set of men in all that time than those of the 2nd Colorado Cavalry. So, among the mysteries is, uh, this account says no Confederates killed, uh, no Confederate guerrillas killed, Federal count says nine, with 15 wounded. Uh, George Todd did commandeer the mail wagon that was along and hauled off two or three people, one of whom was thought to be uh, Ike Flannery, uh, who did survive the war. There were two others that were also named as being possibles, and they also survived the war, so they did not die. So. We don't know for sure how many Confederate bushwhackers, if any, are killed, and, and none are identified so far. <coughs> so that's uh, one of the mysteries. As, as so often is the case in these Missouri Civil War events, uh, real contradictory evidence. I remember uh, one incident down in Carroll County, actually, uh, on the Grand River between Carroll County and Sheraton County. There were either zero Confederates killed or 80. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, I, had, I had a lot of trouble with that. I finally figured out the answer was there were two different incidents in one day because there were Confederates washing up on the shore, so there were some killed. So I, I believe it's two different incidents at one crossing in the same day. Would they be about the same time that the Battle of Fredericksburg, they were chasing Buddy Bill Anderson out across Carroll County and out across the Grand River? Would that be the same? No, I think it was a little earlier. Same the end. Anyway, same, same yeah. deal. So the, uh, the Yankees that were killed, Nine, I believe, including Seymour Wagner, were brought back into uh, Independence. Uh, there's one story about they chased second Colorado guys clear back to within sight of Independence. Frank James supposedly killed four then, but that doesn't seem to be a true story to me uh, because they're not in the count and they would be. The nine were buried in uh, Woodlawn Cemetery in Independence. Um, at what, and uh, within two months, a, uh, a monument was was up and operable, supposedly of Verm Vermont marble. I don't know whether that was uh, on purpose or not. Didn't want Missouri marble. But uh, at any rate, the monument uh, is up. It's thought, <coughs> thought to be the first uh, monument to uh, Civil War, first Civil War monument west of Miss, Mississippi, perhaps the third in the United States, and it's still standing. On July 19th, at 10 a.m., Saturday morning, July 19, 10 a.m., uh, the monument's going to be rededicated. 
Uh, if you don't like calling it the Second Colorado Monument, you can call it the Monument to the Greater Farm Fight. And uh, uh, something like 148 Confederates, by one count, buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. So, and, and a few, few Yankees. <laughs> so, uh, what happens after the Greater Farm Fight? Well, pretty quick we've got uh, the Camden Point Fight comes up, the Battle of Fredericksburg comes up, and uh, all the events preceding Price's Raid in the fall of 1864, of which there were a number uh, everywhere, clear across Missouri. Fall of 1865. It's four. <laughs> so, any questions? That's the greater farm fight. Yeah. There's quite a discrepancy in the official report of 25 participants on the from the Colorado Cavalry versus what the homeboys say there was. 25 to 63. It's a pretty big difference. Well, the, there's all, all, all sorts of biases and errors on all accounts all the way through the war, but particularly in the OR, uh, the, official, the official records, which you're talking about, right. uh, they, they would tend to over, overestimate the enemy especially if they got whopped, and underestimate themselves or, or be accurate. And so I, if I had to guess, I would say there were about 25 Coloradans, or second Colorado, and probably 60 guerrillas, <coughs> not, not 100 or 150, like some accounts. 25 wouldn't even be company strength, where 63 could have been considered company strength. Yeah. But and, you know, so if he went out with company C or whatever that was, it seems like there'd be more than 25, especially if you expected trouble. And we, I don't know if they did or not. Yeah. Uh, don't know about that. I, I would tend to think that it's pretty consistent on the Yankee side, is that there was. Twenty-five smaller groups. Yeah, and but it, it, the, the Confederate account in the Jackson County history had it almost equal numbers, right? Sixty-three and sixty-two. Yeah, they could have got their account from that Red Book, you know. Well, that, well that's their from their book. Yeah, yeah, yeah their, their account is in the Red Book. <laughs> but it was based on an unknown gorilla, you know. Yeah, and yeah, that's. Of course, right there, you go from 25 to 60, and then the other side, 60 to 100, you know, so you get this wide range, which, like you said, that's what always the problem. Yeah, and it happens time and time again. You can hardly, uh, hardly figure, uh, all you can do is try, try good sets, but I, I would tend to think there were 25 and 60 gorillas, but, and none killed. I, that kind of worries me. Huh? They, as far as the gorillas went, their tactic was that normally they wouldn't fight a pitched battle unless they had the advantage. So they got one of the Union troopers and then they got tackled. Makes sense, too. And so that was just one of their common things. I mean, very right. seldom did you ever find a, a small number of gorillas operating against a large force of Union troops. They just like Colorado, they had gun, uh, rifles or some such thing, uh, and on, only one pistol, apparently. And the rules each one had a thin weight and four to eight pistols, and that would include two pummel. Yeah. Uh, carbines pretty effective, too. That first round out of them carbines, Hard to believe they didn't hit something, especially if they were good shooters, you know. It <laughs> could be pretty good with the carbine on horseback. 
and on the other hand, the Union account did report nine guerrillas killed. So uh, that doesn't seem to be right. So, Can you get a chance to look at the diaries that Mike Calvert spoke last month to us uh, out of the Civil War Roundtable? Have you got a chance to look at any of the diaries that he claimed that they have anyway from the Second Colorado? Uh, I just found out about one today. There, there are a couple of older books about the Second Colorado. Well, my next question is, do you know a guy by the name of Harry Saltashaw? Have you ever heard that name before, Harry Saltashaw? He wrote a couple... I think he wrote at least one book, if not two, on the second Colorado anyway. He's kind of, he was doing this back in the late 80s. I went to high school with this guy, and I see him all the time. And as a matter of fact, I just talked to him here the other day and was telling him, I wish I'd have got you to come to the last meeting that we had, that, you know, maybe we'll get together and we'll drop in and we're round table guys, because he's a, he's a semi pretty good expert on some of this stuff. I'll put it to you this way, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but do you know who Liz Johnson is, for instance, the James Farm president? He I accuses know. her of a lot of plagiarism anyway. He doesn't care for her too much, I'll put it that way. Harry Saltashock is the guy that got the mom that was in the James Farm. He knew the guy that had it for years, and he worked for Clay County Parks. He actually worked at the James Farm and told him, if I could come up with the basically the remnants of the bomb anyway, it was in a very wealthy person in Clay County's private possession. It had been stolen in the 1970s. Harry knew where it was at. He told Clay County, if I get this back for you, you know, will I be immune to prosecution? Clay County almost arrested him over it. I think Jim Baldwin told me about that. Yeah, that's Harry Saltashock, who yeah. it is. I went to high school with him, and like I said, I see him all the time, but I'll get him. If you guys want, I'll sometime I'll have him come in and talk to us a little bit. If you'd yeah, like Mr. Speaker. Him. But he's been out of it for a while, and I keep pumping him. I do a lot of genealogy and stuff on my family, and I've had a lot of Civil War relatives. And so every time he comes by, he has a lawn mowing business. He mows yards next to me, and I start pumping him with this stuff. And he keeps saying, man, i got to get back into it. So I'll start throwing stuff in my thumb. But my question was, did you know anything about his writings anyway over the second Colorado that were several years ago? I did. And books is about all I know, too. So yeah. yeah. Surprise. When I told him about the... Uh, told the uh, diary or whatever. He was real curious. He wanted to know, and I couldn't remember Mike Calvert's name at the time. But yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a Missouri Civil War message board, which is well right. worth... I've been on there several times. Okay. Uh, just uh, type in Second Colorado mm -hmm. okay. on, on forum search, and it'll pop up. I believe it's a guy named Gordon's diction, or diary. I believe the guy's name is, is Gordon. Uh, I'm usually looking for different stuff anyway. I know that's kind of his thing, is that second Colorado deal, and that's why you know, I kind of bring this up and, and kind of pick in your mind what you know about it because yeah. he's got a lot of interest in it. Well, I'm glad to hear that story about uh, what had happened to the bomb at the James Farm. I, that's the guy that recovered it for okay. him, and they almost arrested him for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have it, I'll put it that way. I tried asking what, where it had been all those years, and I never got a straight answer. Well, well I don't know if Harry had divulged that to you, but uh, if you'd like to meet him sometime, I'll try and get him to one of these yeah. meetings. Or, I've, uh, held, I've held the bomb in my yeah. hand. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Was it little pieces? or? No, it's about, it's about two-thirds yeah. two of the original so bomb. Blew out one end of it or something. Well, see, it killed Reuben Samuel's son. See, my aunt is Fanny Samuel, married to Reuben Hitt. Reuben Hitt is my fourth great grandmother, Mary, and then joined the land of other living Manning's brother. Wow. That's who that is. So. Now, all we need to see is just a part to me. Well, uh, yeah, that's good. We'll, good we'll get together man. on that sometime. Yeah. Like that. Carol? I need to go to his family. John, John. He says, go on. He says, go on. Talk about the, the mysteries. Well, one of the mysteries is how many were on each side. One of them is how many was killed on each side. Is there any other things that are part of the mysteries? Any other questions? Uh, you know, why did the gorillas do it? Uh, were they after James Totten? Yeah. Were they after the male cow? The male. Was James there? Was no. He with that he, he he had been in Independence <laughs> and he went by. <laughs> A different road. I don't know whether 
somehow they knew. There's all sorts of spies. These guys might have been the decoys. Could be. Those how, 25 guys? Yeah. They've been sent out there as chop liver, you know? Well, we hope, we hope not, but, uh, uh, yeah, they, he, he apparently went through Hickman Mills. Have you, ever heard, have you ever heard the story how they used to pass messages along, like in Liberty, Missouri, Fairview Cemetery, they used to go in there and put notes in one of the, the grave markers or whatever, and they'd go by and pick them up, gorillas would, or the Southern Sympathizers. Yeah. Most of those people were from Kentucky and Tennessee and that anyway. Uh, Virginia, actually, actually Virginia, Kentucky, and, and then on to Missouri anyway. At least it's when my family came in. They were at the Cape Girardeau in 1800, so. Well, and in, in and other, there were other ways too. That I was one of the accounts I was reading today was talking about uh, shots. They, they were going going along somewhere, and then about every fifteen or twenty minutes, they'd hear a shot off in the distance. And, but also, I think they signaled from uh, in Jackson County at least the knobs, such as Bone Hill. There's a number of knobs if you know where Bone Hill is. Right. And I don't and think most people realize the genealogy involved in most of those gorillas. Most of those gorillas were related, either through blood or marriage, one way or another. Like I say, I've got James ties, I've got political Anderson ties, I've got ties to Clifton Holstall, he's my cousin. Those families were married into each other. And I can go back to the 1700s and explain the ties to the Hackley family, which is really Bill Anderson's mother's family and some of those families. So all those families, they all knew each other. And they, you know, they were sending messages through the family members and stuff <coughs> like that. And Sims, where was the, the printer farm? How close to, to Lee Summit Road was it? There? Right, right, on the right on the road. Right on the road? Yeah. Okay, and where was the fight? Was it right on the road as well or just? Yeah, the, if, if you were uh, off the northeast corner of that four-way intersection, there's an open field. I envision it was right in there. But yeah, because they were coming down the road and they were attacked, so I mean, it almost had to be on or very near. Is this south or north of I-70? South. Uh, south. south. My Lee Summit Airport, south of Lee Summit Airport. Yeah, so. Yeah. Now, so is that 5, 10 miles, something just, like that? Just north of Truman East. Huh? Yeah, just I don't know where that is. Well, <laughs> take, but it's here. take the Lee Summit exit off I-70. Right. And uh, head straight out. Lee Summit Road, when you get oh, to Truman five, East. Truman Lakewood, actually. Okay. Uh, which will be on your right. You've gone just a little bit too far. Okay. You come back a half mile. Sure. Blue, Four blue, way. blue cuts in there, too, ain't it? Uh, yeah, probably. You know, Harold, that old farmhouse there, it's got the stone pillars and you know, the tiles with the address in it. Do you think that, that was built after? But that was the that was also the Grinter house, wasn't it? Well, I'm t I'm told the Grinter farm was just north of there, just yeah. you know, real close. So. And it wasn't his son the photographer? In the Independence yeah. pioneer photographer. Yes. Yeah. There's an old postcard that's got Harry and Bess walking into the old uh, courthouse, the old log courthouse, and it's got Grinter's name on it. Yeah. On there. Yeah, a lot of the old photographs. Oh yeah, Grinner was a well-known, you know, early photographer. As a matter of fact, most of them. they did that early pioneer map of Jackson County too. Yeah, you've seen it. It's just one of the things here on those on the monuments. The boat probably about 20 years ago. And that was <coughs> when I uh, had gotten a book on Civil War sites around the country, and mentioned there was a monument in Lagrange, Missouri. So when I was, First went up to Athens. Without long, I'm going to stop and see this. And it's a little city park there. And at the time, you know, there was really nobody to talk to that I could find. You know, it was a sort of one of those trips, and I thought it said 1864 on there. Well, you know, this must, it's got to be the Union monument for, for where it is and the time it was put up. And then about a year ago, I went back through there, and uh, some of the Union, Union veterans out of St. Louis had. Uh, Fixed it up, put a wrought iron fence around it, put a little mark at the bottom of it and all that. There's a local woman that claims it's, it was put up after the war and it also had to, it was also a Confederate monument and 
Uh, that's that's not true. I mean, it's got 1864 on it. It's actually, uh, I'm not sure which regiment, but there were Illinois soldiers stationed there. And in 1864, when Price was coming up, they were ordered to leave the range, and they put that up at the time they were leaving. So, you know, at that time, I said, well, now there's two monuments in the, uh, west of the Mississippi River that were actually put up during the war, not yeah. just the one. It's just that that one was put up really just sort of a, a memorial to, to, you know, the Union soldiers there. It doesn't say who it's to. It's got the uh, state emblem on it with the bears, and it's got 1864 on it. And I, when I met this woman about a year ago there, and I said, well, why would they put 1864 on it if it was put up after the war? And a lot of stuff that she said didn't make any sense, you know. But uh, as far as other monuments that were put up during the war, uh, the surrender, the original surrender monument in Vicksburg was real poor marble, and they took it down and put up a, a different monument. There's old postcards that shows the original surrender monument, and that was put up during the war, about a year about a year after. Uh, the Hazen Brigade monument in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, still exists. So that's one that was put up again about a year after Murfreesboro was, you know, end of 1862, and so uh, it was put up before that. There was one in Kentucky that the, the soldier actually carved on the battlefield. It was taken to Louisville. When I went there uh, several years ago, you could go and there was like a box over it. You had to get down on your hands and knees and look up underneath and they've taken it out of the cemetery and made a replica and put it back in there. So if you think about the ones that I've discovered around the United States that were actually put up during the war, these two in Missouri are two that still exist, that, that haven't been taken down and replaced like the Surrender Monument in Vicksburg and the one in Kentucky, too. The Asian Brigade uh, is a huge monument there. There's supposedly one at uh, Romney, West Virginia, also. Uh, now, that was the first Confederate monument put up after the war. Okay. There's old postcards of that. And they claim it was the first. I had a Confederate relative killed. Yeah. That's why I always remember that one. Yeah, so I, don't, I haven't been able to find any Confederate monuments they were put up during the war. None. Uh, they were too busy fighting. They didn't have time yeah, for that. Yeah, they just, <laughs> just trying to eat and you know, stay the, alive. Here, the, Harold, now here's a, to like up at Kirksville. You know, they put up a new monument a few years back. Uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans did, you know, for the guys that were massacred there, uh, you know, executed. But, you know, there's two old monuments there. Right next to each other is the tall one, and then there's one about this tall right next to it. And I thought, well, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And they claim that the, the, that Confederate monument was actually put up by the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, and I've been trying to find stuff in the newspaper and these things, and just haven't been able to really prove anything. But that little short monument next to the tall one could have possibly been put up during the war. And because, because why would you put up another one sometime within 10, maybe less than 20 years after the war, right next to it? These uh, are, it's a monument to the... For, for those one guys that were executed. Yeah, yeah. 10 that were executed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just sort of a lot. I've been there. Year. Actually, Missouri is sort of interesting because if you think about it, it, you know, my research, I'm working on a book on the Confederate monuments in the state of Missouri, and in the process, I had to look at 
stuff in Arkansas and Louisiana and Texas and all that, you know, to say, you know, do we have the oldest Confederate monuments west of the Mississippi River? And we do. And what was amazing is that... What was the first the, Confederate monument? What's it, uh, the one, well, you got a choice. It's either the one at uh, Collins Cemetery in Wayne County that says 1870 on it. The one at Lone Jack would have been put up in 1869, and they decided to wait a year because when they decided to put it up, they were going to dedicate it like a month later. And, you know, there's newspaper articles talking about the governor was going to send state militia and all that to prevent it and all that. Well, that I found other newspaper articles said, well, that's <laughs> the reason being is that they weren't organized. And in 1870, and they did it in September, not in August, the Yankees were holding reunions at Lone Jack prior to 1869. Okay, and they were trying to put up a monument. The landowner wouldn't put, let them put one up unless they put up a Confederate monument too. Well, it turns out though, with the Confederates waiting a year until September of 1870, they had 10,000 people at Lone Jack. Okay, so you got the one in Wayne County says 1870. I don't know what month. I haven't been able to find any newspaper articles at all. Uh, you know, Wayne County, the county seat, doesn't even have a library. So it's, you know, newspapers down in southeast Missouri from back then are few and far between. But looking at when a lot of monuments were dedicated, they were usually dedicated prior to, you know, September or October, you know, and. Uh, and those guys were killed on the way back, you know, or actually down in Arkansas. They're supposed to put up a replica of that monument down in Arkansas where they were killed, and then they brought the bodies back up to Wayne County. Well, to me, it seems like that would have been in the spring, you know, maybe you know, April, May, June, somewhere in there is when they were killed, and then their body. So it seems to me they probably wouldn't put that, you know, dedicated that one prior to September of 1870. Okay. Now there's a couple others that, you know, that are old monuments. I haven't been able to find a couple of dates on them. That one in Newark, Missouri, I uh, found an old newspaper article that said that they moved the bodies in 1875 to the cemetery. So, which means they put the monument up somewhere probably within that five years. This is an old white marble uh, monument. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Last question. Which side do you believe are something in the middle, probably? What do you think the truth is? I think they're probably 25 second Colorado, 63 bushwhackers. That's a good answer. All right, let's give a round of applause to Harold.